I hope the United States will keep out of this war. I believe that it will. And I give you assurance and reassurance that every effort of your government will be directed toward that end. As long as it remains within my power to prevent, there will be no blackout of peace in the United States. After World War I, there was a surge of isolationism, feeling that we had got no reason for us becoming involved in World War I, and we'd made a mistake, and that uh, uh, there were a lot of debts which were owed by European countries, and the country went isolationist. I haven't the slightest idea of European affairs. Let you have fight our own battle. Another war, not for me. This time America should keep out, and I know I will. If war breaks out in Europe, I think that this country should heed the advice of its first president and avoid all foreign entanglements. In early 1940, Britain's ambassador in Washington reported that nine out of ten Americans were determined to keep America out of the war. A few, like the American Nazi Party, were even determined that America should aid Britain's enemies. Their uh, country was enormously divided. Uh... There was the America First movement, which was advocating isolationism. On the other hand, there was the William Allen White Committee, the committee to defend America by aiding the Allies that was on the other side. We had these curious voices such as Charles Lindbergh's and so on, which were the voices of isolationism. In the past, we have built with a Europe dominated by England and France. In the future, we may have to deal with a Europe dominated by Germany. If we desire to keep... Charles Lindbergh, thanks to his extraordinary exploit, was a very popular figure. He was almost a folk hero. And so he would have influence. I suppose that celebrities of all characters ha do have influence. Otherwise, they wouldn't be endorsing products all the time. But it should not involve the internal affairs of Europe. They never were and never will be carried on according to our desires. There was a strong anti-British antipathy in certain parts of the country. Uh, it was felt that Britain was trying very hard to drag us into its war. Nineteen forty was presidential election year in the United States, and Roosevelt's main concern that summer was to get himself re-elected. Ladies and gentlemen, the 22nd Convention of the Republican Party will now come to order. Even as we meet, lights are going out in Europe. Blackouts of dictators take the place of lighthouses of free men. Ours is the grave responsibility to preserve the lighthouses of liberty. In the name of the people of the whole United States, I place in nomination <laughs> 
that valiant American, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. After France's fall, most Americans were disposed to aid Britain in some way, but still more were strongly opposed to entering the war on Britain's side. Third-term candidate has not kept faith with the American people. Roosevelt's opponent in the presidential election that autumn was an out-and-out anti-war candidate, Wendell Wilkie. In his promise to keep our boys out of foreign wars is no better than his promise to balance the budget. They're already almost on the transport. But with the Nazis triumphant everywhere, Roosevelt couldn't afford to wait to be re-elected before putting America on some sort of war footing. The Congress has debated without partisanship and has now enacted a law establishing a selective method of augmenting our armed forces. We must and we will marshal our great potential strength to fend off war from our shores. More than 16 million young Americans are reviving the 300-year-old American custom of the muster, by which from the earliest colonial times, every able-bodied citizen was subject to the call for service in the national defense. The first number drawn by the Secretary of War is serial number 158. I'm honored to be one of, one of those first call, and I'll try very hard to make a, a real good soldier. Then I'm proud of you. If you elect me President of the United States, I shall never send an American boy to fight in any European war. I consider it a public duty to answer falsifications with facts. I will not pretend that I find this an unpleasant duty. <laughs> I am an old campaigner and I love a good fight. Roosevelt got his good fight. Though to stay in the race, he had promised, like his opponent, not to send American boys to fight in foreign wars. Name, please. you, Roosevelt. November the 5th, 1940, was election day. And by midnight, America's choice of president for another four years was clear. The results are now conclusive. Roosevelt wins. Now re-elected, Roosevelt felt he had a mandate to give Britain all aid short of war. But he could only move slowly, for America was still deeply divided. Many of the war measures, such as steps to give aid to Britain at the time when England was standing alone and was beleaguered, many have just squeaked by in Congress. Even uh, a program of uh, armament, of preparedness, was uh, military preparedness got through Congress on uh, very, very close votes, one-vote margins in a total of 400 votes. Then the extraordinary piece of legislation, which was Lend-Lease, was proposed in December of 1940, but that came law in March of 41. And under that, the president did everything he possibly could to give aid to Britain. Now, my instructions when I went over to represent him uh, were very simple, very brief. Uh, they were to uh, contact the British government to find out uh, what we could do to help Britain short of war. 
And we began at once doing all sorts of things which were not really neutral under the literal interpretation. For instance, we were repairing British naval vessels in American ports, and we escorted your convoys across the Atlantic as far as Iceland, and we transferred two million tons of ships. The immediate problem was to get people to understand what it was. In this, I think Mr. Roosevelt's very simple analogy of the of lending your neighbor a fire hose when there's a fire was the most persuasive kind of simple illustration. The people of Europe who are defending themselves do not ask us to do their fighting. They ask us for the implements of war, the planes, the tanks, the guns, the freighters, which will enable them to fight for their liberty and our security. We must be the great arsenal of democracy. For us, this is an emergency as serious as war itself. In those days, uh, the business community regarded uh, uh, Roosevelt as a, a, at a minimum as a major deputy of the devil, and uh, Roosevelt was deeply suspicious of the businessmen so that the people who were associated with the mobilizing of the war uh, were, had a divided interest. Uh, some of them felt that their main purpose in being in Washington was to put a curb on the socialist excesses of the New Deal. Uh, some of them were uneasy about being there. They had something of the feeling of people who were um, playing in an orchestra in a, in a brothel. and. Uh, uh, there was also uh, a, a great unwillingness. We hear now about the military-industrial complex. In those days, there was a great unwillingness to convert from civilian industry. There was a feeling that uh, a war production would be a very unprofitable business. You would lose markets for automobiles, for tires, for chemicals, and so forth. Uh, there was a problem with some of the unions up until June of 1941. Until Russia was in the war, and in the days of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, there was foot dragging on the part of some of the union leaders. And there were strikes. Four times as many workers were on strike in 1941 as in the year before. That spring, nearly half a million coal miners struck for almost a month while on the west coast, a walkout that summer at North American Aviation delayed deliveries of planes to Britain for several weeks. It took troops to get production moving again. But although Roosevelt was still reluctant to lead America into war, the war was now catching up with America. June the 11th, 1941, an American freighter, the Robin Moore, was sunk by a U-boat. Roosevelt used this as a pretext for occupying Iceland and relieving the British garrisons there. September the 4th, the U.S. destroyer, Greer, was attacked by a U-boat near Iceland. Roosevelt now told his Navy to shoot on sight. October the 16th, the U.S. destroyer Kearney was struck by a German torpedo while escorting a convoy in mid-Atlantic and 11 of her crew were killed. Roosevelt used this incident to push through Congress the repeal of the Neutrality Act. We have wished to avoid shooting, but the shooting has started and history has recorded who fired the first shot. In the long run, however, all that will matter is who fired the last shot. The repeal of our Neutrality Act will be the last step on the road to war. If we load our ships with contraband of war and send them into combat zones, they will most certainly be sunk. And that means war, a war which, in the opinion of many of us, 
although designed to save democracy abroad, will surely destroy it at home right here in America. On October the 30th, the U.S. destroyer Reuben James was sunk with the loss of 115 lives. Officers in all hands forward had perished. Myself and 45 men were all of us alive. But despite pressure from Churchill, who dearly wanted America in the war, Roosevelt now did nothing. It was becoming clear it would take much more than the drowning of a hundred or so American seamen to bring America into the war. There was even sentiment, uh, I remember this being expressed to the effect that uh, England would uh, fight to the last American. There were steps that were developing, the gradual steps to be sure, somewhat comparable to the steps that took place in World War I. You know, one incident after another, I remember the torpedoed Sussex got us excited and then there was the Lusitania episode. And the same way, I think, that with the, the moves that Mr. Roosevelt were making, the cash and carry uh, uh, program that he had, the protection of the convoys, the destroyer deal, one thing and another were occurring that would be apt to produce, I think, a, an incident that would uh, set the war off. The incident, when it came, was massive, and it came in an unexpected place, Pearl Harbor. All Army and Navy bases on the island of Oahu in Hawaii are now under air attack. For the latest news, keep tuned to this station. I found that my superior, who was in charge of all of the civilian operations of the war, was away. So I was then sent on to the great the meeting of the wartime leaders that convened in Washington on the night of Pearl Harbor. I remember my uh, sense of mission in going into that meeting. We had also seen the war coming. Here was the day and here was the hour, and here was I attending the meeting with the other great men. We got to the meeting, and uh, the other great men, myself included, were one hell of a disappointment because nobody could think of anything to say or do. And it seemed like a good idea to see what materials were threatened by the Japanese advance. Everybody was coming in during the course of this, some in uh, sport jackets and some in tennis shoes. And uh, uh, it became terribly evident that nobody had any real information as to where these strategic commodities came from. And eventually, the whole discussion bogged down, I remember, on the question of KPOC. KPOC, everybody thought, was uh, a strategic, it was clearly listed as a strategic material. It evidently came from that part of the world, and nobody could think, for God's sake, what the stuff was used for. I ask that the Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. Even now, Roosevelt couldn't bring himself to ask that the United States declare war on Germany. Although Britain had already allied herself with the U.S. against Japan, but Hitler decided for him. For some unexplained reason, Hitler declared war on the United States, which relieved Roosevelt of all of his difficulties. Well, I was practicing law in Chicago at that time. Yeah, that is, at the time of Pearl Harbor. And I can tell you that if... If Hitler had not made this decision, if he had simply done nothing, that there would have been an enormous sentiment in the United States, in many parts of the United States, that uh, the Pacific War now was our war, that the uh, European war was for the Europeans, and that we should concentrate all our efforts against the Japanese. Lots of land under starry skies above Don't fence me in Let me ride through the wide open country that I love 
Don't fans me in. People were selling their homes at a fraction of their value. They were certain that the West Coast would be under attack, that we'd be bombed here. There were even blackouts along the West Coast as there were along the East Coast. And there were even some false alerts here. Not everybody took these precautions seriously. To European eyes, America's going to war had moments both ludicrous and familiar. those we call aliens. We must remember that our parents or our grandparents or our great-grandparents all were aliens in their day. If you believe you have knowledge of any improper activity of any alien, you should report the fact to the nearest FBI office. Don't try to be the law yourself. There was a tremendous change, the change being that we were the same individuals uh, prior to December 7th. December 8th, when we went to school, many of our classmates and friends uh, called us dirty Japs, um, teased us, harassed us, and our, our so-called friends were no longer friends. In the First World War, as you know, the Germans were hated thoroughly, and there was, no, and there was a great deal of discrimination and, and, and harassment of the Ger Germans. In the Second World War, they were at war with uh, three different nationalities, the Italians, the Germans, and the Japanese. And I remember that, uh, you know, Thomas Mann and Bruno Walter spoke up for the, for the Germans and said they couldn't be uh, removed because they would uh, be the last despair, having re fled Nazi Germany to be again put into a concentration camp. And, and Joe DiMaggio's mother spoke up, you know, and that was a very moving effect in, in, in San Francisco, I remember. But the Japanese had really n nobody. I think uh, the picking on the Japanese was partly a kind of a logistically uh, rational thing that the army could handle. They said, no, we can't handle the Germans, but we can handle the Japanese. After all, they couldn't have moved all the Germans and the Italians in this country. They would have had to move half the people out of New York City. I mean, it would have been ridiculous. These people had always been rather unpopular because they competed uh, with the American farmers in truck gardening and things of that kind and worked very much harder and cultivated their land very much more efficiently. So that a lot of people took advantage of, of their situation to create uh, uh, antipathy toward them. And the government acted hastily and rather brutally. And it's not a very attractive chapter. More than 100,000 Japanese Americans were interned en masse, mostly those on the West Coast. Whereas the 600,000 German and Italian Americans were treated individually. Although we had heard rumors of an evacuation, we didn't realize that it was going to indeed take place. We were told that we could only take what we could carry. The evacuees had three choices. They either had to sell their property, abandon it, or store it. 
And in many cases, because of the uncertainty of the situation, many people just disposed of their property as best as they could. We were then put on buses and taken to assembly centers. From the assembly centers, we lived in horse stalls or in quickly made tar paper barracks. The mental anguish that my mother went through having four of her sons in the service of the United States government and having her husband uh, labeled a dangerous enemy alien. We had guards, uh, watchtowers, machine guns. It was a um, picture of incarceration. We, we felt that we were prisoners, prisoners in our own country. certain was that there was going to be no more rubber for a while and that we'd have to make do with the stock of rubber tires that we had. And it wasn't in the authority of our agency to stop the sale of rubber tires, so we drew up an order anyway. And uh, we had an anonymous young man circulated through all the offices in the Office of Production Management that had to clear all pieces of paper. It was already very bureaucratic. Walked in, with says, here's the rubber, here's the tire order, sir. Everybody signed it. And we froze the whole nation stock of rubber tires. Everybody got work. This was very much appreciated after the long, deep depression of the 1930s. You might have thought that inflation would have been the major problem, because in most countries, in most wars, it's always been a major problem. But uh, very early, we mobilized, we put in uh, a rationing, and uh, although there was a small amount of grumbling, it's amazing how well the rationing system worked. I think there was a tendency to accept shortages, and with one exception. People were very resistant to gasoline rationing. Uh, clothing shortages, food shortages, coffee, sugar, people would accept. But uh, there was no form of rascality, chicanery, thievery, larceny that people wouldn't engage in to get extra gasoline. I think the thing that they most resented uh, was the extreme use of many of us who were doing it. Um, the Office of Price Administration, as I look back on it, uh, must have been very hard to take. I was then 31. Uh, <clears throat> David Ginsburg, my immediate associate and general counsel, was 29. <clears throat> and uh, most everybody else was uh, younger than we were, including uh, Richard Nixon, who was one of the more obscure employees of the agency. There's a famous wartime uh, picture of uh, Sewell Avery, a great tycoon of the last age, who was the head of Montgomery Ward and who had brought it out of the Depression, being carried out of his office by two American soldiers in uniform because he wouldn't comply with the War Labor Board. Our war program for the coming fiscal year will cost $56 billion. That means taxes and bonds, and bonds and taxes. And we have a squeal with each organ, ladies and gentlemen. Oh! Yeah, I'm new at this, right? Oh! Can you get your organ? Can you go this way, please? Yeah.
Twenty-two fifty. This is really a, a handsome thing to have. You're, you're getting this as a premium for a war bond for twenty-two hundred and fifty dollars. So it's really a, a, a good purchase for anybody. Now you see it? Hope is looking at the shoe. He may increase his bid to twenty-two fifty-five. <laughs> you're going to come up a little, aren't you, Flabby? I should we got twenty-two fifty. I'll go twenty-five. <laughs> Our enemies aren't pushovers. They're savage, skillful, and relentless. They've trained for years for just this chance to enslave the world, and that's just what they intend to do. And they'll use every trick and tool. But on the other hand, they aren't supermen. They didn't come down from Mars. They can be licked, and they will be licked. By men. We fought in 1917 from Tiddy Dum 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 and drove the tyrant from the sea from Tiddy Dum Dum Dum. We're in a bigger, better war for your patriotic pastime. We don't know what we're fighting for, but we didn't know the last time. So load the cannon, draw the blade from Tiddy Dum Dum Dum. Come on and join the big It was airplanes in the hands of a treacherous foe that brought my husband to his death. And if I can qualify as an airplane worker at Vega and with my hands help to keep him flying, I will feel that I am carrying on for him. Here's the boot ring, calling one and all to the Marshal Queen. Strike up the band. To be done, to be done. There's a war to be won, to be won. Come, you son of a son of a gun. Take your stand on a night he bow. Come along, let's go. Hey, leader, strike up the man. We are doing our share, but we're going to do infinitely more than we have done. We have in our town today two mothers, each of whom has given two sons already. And as I said before, we'll give our sons, we'll give our lives, but by the help and grace of God, we will not give up a free America or our democratic way of life. Strike up the band. Yankee doo 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 We'll come through doo 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 for the red, white, blue doo 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 Lend a hand. The flag on we can lick the world On the night of Pearl Harbor, one man had been happy. Winston Churchill, for now he knew Britain was saved. A few days later, he journeyed to Washington to make sure the war was going to be fought on the British plan of Europe first and the Pacific second, and to cement the new Anglo-American alliance. What kind of a people do they think we are? Is it possible they do not realize that we shall never cease to persevere against them until they have been taught a lesson which they and the world will never forget? Time, Churchill knew, was on the Allies' side. With America's industrial might behind them, they could not lose. Nineteen forty two began badly for the Americans in the Pacific. Manila, capital of the Philippines, fell to the Japanese on January the first. Japanese pushed the American forces on the Philippines back into the narrow peninsula of Bataan. The American plan was to hold out there for six months or so until reinforcements came. 
but the reinforcements never did come, and nor had Bataan been really prepared for a siege. American troops besieged at Patan had no air support, were short of medical supplies, and their morale was poor. Even their commander-in-chief, General MacArthur, had left them for safer shores. Their bitter ballad, we are the battling bastards of Patan. No mama, no papa, no uncle Sam. No aunts, no uncles, no cousins, no nieces, no pills, no planes or artillery pieces. And nobody gives a goddamn. Cock a hoop with the ease of their victories so far. The Japanese called on the Americans beleaguered in Bataan to surrender. The boys of the Philippines and calling the attention of everyone, everywhere. Everyone, everywhere. All Filipinos and Americans all over the country. And all of you Filipinos and Americans. They tried leaflets, too. Aimed mostly at the Filipino soldiers among the American forces. The Japanese closed in for the kill. In early May 1942, the American commander in the Philippines, General Wainwright, bowed to the inevitable and surrendered the remainder of his forces. I decided to accept, in the name of humanity, the formal surrender of all American and Philippine Army troops in the Philippine Islands. You will, repeat, will surrender all troops to the proper Japanese officers. 80,000 Americans surrendered. The largest mass capitulation in American military history. The Japanese made the Americans march in the blazing sun to prison camps a hundred or so miles from Bataille. Deprived of water and medicine, starved and brutally beaten, some 10,000 soldiers died along the way more than had been killed in the actual fighting for Bataan. By that spring of 1942, the Japanese conquests were at their peak. Surely the British and Americans would now want to make peace, argued Tokyo, a peace that would allow the Japanese to retain their conquests. But already... Bold steps were being taken to strike back at the Japanese, here, in the heart of their empire, Tokyo. I was on this cruiser called the Northampton, and we were several days out at sea when we saw the Hornet coming up. And the Hornet had very unusual planes on deck. You could see them from a long way. They were large, land-based planes, B-25s. We had only one real worry. That would have been a dead calm. Under those conditions, taking off the carrier deck with the heavy loads that we had would have been, at best, precarious. The worst thing that we thought might happen would be a completely alerted Japan waiting for us. What did happen was that the, f the morning, just before takeoff, we encountered two Japanese fishing boats. They spotted our task force, sent a message 
to the mainland, but unfortunately for the Japanese, were sunk before they could repeat the message. So we achieved almost complete surprise. was minimal. We were 16 airplanes, each with one ton of bombs. In the later stages of World War II, the 20th Air Force under LeMay was sending out 500 airplanes, each with 10 tons of bombs. So we dropped 16 against a later rate of 5,000. So the, the damage was not at all great. However, it did have some advantages. One, we had had nothing but bad news at home. So it was the first good news our folks got, and it was uh, appreciated as good news. It caused the Japanese to question their warlords who had, inform had informed them that Japan would never be attacked. The Doolittle Raid stung Japan's leaders and made them careless. Ever since Pearl Harbor, Japan's Navy had been looking for a decisive battle with America's Navy. A battle that would decide once and for all mastery of the Pacific. In early June 1942, the Japanese carriers rendezvoused close to Midway Island, some 1,300 miles northwest of Hawaii. We had ceased to be as wary as before. The Americans knew in advance that we would attack Midway. They were waiting for us and we walked into their trap. While the Japanese Navy's attention was focused on Midway Island, the American Navy were preparing to strike back at the Japanese carrier fleet. We had a wonderful advantage. We were breaking their code, and they didn't know it. So we had some idea what was going to happen there. We were on the scene with the carrier force in the right spot to meet them. <laughs> 
greatest sea battles of all time meant the U.S. regained naval control of the Pacific and was the end of Japan's hope of any further conquests. The same four Japanese carriers that had launched the raid on Pearl Harbor six months before were destroyed by planes from the very American carriers that had been at sea and escaped destruction that day. The Battle of Midway doomed Japan. The Midway Battle was, many people say, the turning point of the Pacific War. That is, the turning point from complete retreat on our part, or at least attempt to est establish a stalemate, and uh, offensive. Turning point, not just at sea, but on land too. The island of Guadalcanal in the Solomons, the southernmost limit of the Japanese conquests. In August 1942, the Allies returned. For the Americans, it was their first invasion of the war. We had such a tiny fraction of America's force and money resources and manpower resources. 90% went to Europe. We had such a tiny little thread of existence down there. It was our first offensive in the Pacific, and we went in with only one division. tough fighters, and they, they never would give up. We had isolated a, a Japanese regiment in what was known as the Gifu Strong Point, and they fought until we actually had to annihilate them. We used the loudspeakers after we had surrounded them and tried to persuade them to surrender, but they wouldn't surrender. Japanese uh, shouldn't made such a great effort in the Guadalcanal. They could have saved their strength. Long last, the tide had turned for the Allies in the Pacific. But it was still as yet only a sideshow. The main energies were being reserved for Europe. It was really a little odd to the Americans in the general public at that time that we were spending so little effort in the Pacific. President Roosevelt made up his mind that the, the defeat of Hitler was by far the most important to, to achieve first uh, he was the most dangerous of the, of the enemies, and he was very skillful in keeping the American public opinion uh, directed towards uh, Europe, although we did have a very major operation in Japan and a very successful operation after we recovered from the tremendous blow of the loss of a very substantial part of our Navy at Pearl Harbor. I think that uh, generally public opinion had the feeling uh, as we say in baseball, the, the big league was, uh, was in Europe and in the uh, United Kingdom, and, and I include that in, Europe, in Western Europe. Uh, the decision was made early that uh, Europe came first, and it was a wise decision. In spite of the fact that we got the devil knocked out of us in the Pacific for a long time, that was the right decision, and I think everybody recognized it. Now, of course, the Navy protested at being left uh, way underpowered in the Pacific. And uh, it did put us up to very heavy casualties and all of that. But I think the country in general agreed that, with the decision that uh, 
the real threat was in Europe. We could take care of the Japs in our own good time, but the uh, real thing that had to be met was on the continent. This is the army, Mr. Joe. No private rooms or telephone. You had your breakfast in bed before, but you won't have it there anymore. Here we teach you how to kill and get the opponent down on the ground in the quickest manner possible. Snuff out his life by kicking with both feet, one foot, the flat of the hand, the rabbit punch, gouging the eyes out, ripping the mouth. The gentle art of killing a man is to get him on the ground and kick in this manner. See? Sir! And when he comes back, get him through and I kick it. Come on, all of you do that. Sit, come on. Do what the buglers command. They're in the army and not in a band. This is the army, Mr. Brown. You and your baby went to town. She had you worried, but this is for, and she won't worry you anymore. Mr. Joe, Mr. Green, Mr. Brown. Mr. Churchill did have a, a very, a real antipathy, I think, toward getting ashore what he would call prematurely into you know, onto uh, the European continent. He had very vivid memories of the uh, sacrifice of a British generation in uh, World War I, Poshendale and the Somme. They're always uh, nightmares to him. After all uh, this uh, passion that had been aroused as a result of Pearl Harbor and our being in the war and marching and counter-marching and training, we just had to get ashore someplace. In view of the British attitude, which didn't feel that uh, we were prepared to go into the main theater, we looked around for another spot to express our strength, and it turned out it was Africa. November 1942, 600 ships loaded with men and materials set sail for North Africa, Operation Torch, said Roosevelt when he heard the news, at last we're on our way.